My name's Paul. I'm the Weed Management Officer for Yarra Rangers Council and I have been since 2010. Uh, I've been in the environment sector for, well, for quite a while, uh, since the year 2000, so um, I'm showing my age. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, um, I'm, today I'm going to be talking about uh, fauna monitoring in Yarra Rangers. Uh, we mainly do use fauna cameras uh, with our monitoring program only because they're just so easy to use and uh, the technology now is uh, getting to a point where it's, uh, it's, it's becoming better and better. Uh, there are other methods that we do occasionally use as well um, uh, within council and uh, one of them is uh, nest box cameras. So we have a series of nest boxes uh, throughout council area. Uh, in some select reserves and uh, we've got a nest box camera which is kind of like a cigar shaped camera uh, which is then screwed onto a extendable pole and then we uh, gently put them inside the, the nest boxes because it's it's a slightly invasive because you know the, the boxes are not huge and if there's animals in there they tend to get a bit uh, surprised as you'd imagine when the camera goes inside um, and with the light showing so uh, look, it's it, it's it's a good way of doing it because otherwise you have to use a ladder, um, which is okay as well. We've got to be pretty safe. Um, and look, nest boxes is hit and miss. We tend to sometimes have nothing in them at all. Sometimes we've got a bit of uh, leaf litter. Uh, there could be birds that may have nested in there. So most of our boxes are uh, predominantly uh, possums for brush tail possums and uh, look and, and quite a few times we do have them in there and, and they usually utilize sometimes they're in an area they might utilize a few um, you know just sort of share like as if it's like they're all theirs um, and once I have to say that once that I put a camera in there um, the possum decided to grab it and I, I, I couldn't get it out <laughs> and I was thinking what's going on and it was just hanging it's like it's like it thought oh how dare you come into my house and it hung on there and I, I, I seriously thought I couldn't get it out, but eventually it let go and geez. So, but um, yeah, it's a bit of fun. But uh, yeah, there's also spotlighting that we occasionally do um, where yeah, we take uh, groups out into some of the reserves and, um, and look for some nocturnal animals, which are mainly like, you know, ones that come out of tree hollows and hopefully you know, powerful owls and other owls in the area. Uh, that's slightly, you know, we've got to be careful with that too. There are rules behind how, you know, how long you flash lights at these critters because you don't want to really, um, you know, disturb them as well. They're pretty light sensitive, hence why they come out at night. So look, fauna cameras, the infrared motion sensing fauna, fauna cameras are pretty much like, that's, we find that to be the, the best option for monitoring. Uh, it's non-invasive, it's very easy to use. And uh, look, you can get a lot out of it. Like it, you can be quite specific if you want to, or you can just sort of follow a standard and and try and uh, capture as many animals as you as you as you can. Uh, there are limitations to it, though, um, uh, depending on what you're trying to find. Uh, it's, but I'll get into those details a little bit later. Uh, I, I really recommend you try cameras. It's, 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 I, I love it. And, I'm, and it's funny that I'm the one that's doing it because I've got a, uh, I'm, I specialize in plant ecology. So I actually go out for my role predominantly to uh, assess vegetation quality and uh, look at all our bushland sites and, and, um, and spot all the weeds that we have uh, that we need to, to work on. Uh, but uh, I suppose because, um, I'm out in the field quite a bit doing that. Uh, it makes sense that uh, I've been given that opportunity. They thought it would make sense, Council, that you know, while I'm out there, why not uh, two stones? Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I enjoy it. I love it. I think it's great, and it's it's one of the favourite things I have in my role. Um, I'll start the presentation now. Um, so just bear me with me. I'll just try and share my screen. That looks pretty good to me. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, it's going to be a, bit, a little bit boring to start with. I'm going to be uh, a, a little bit pedantic about sort of our background and some of the detail. Uh, this particular photo is not with a fauna camera, mind you. It's just a nice photo that we captured with a standard camera at uh, our old house in Calarama, where we used to live. Of a tawny frog mouth there. Nice, nice animal. Okay. Now, oh. It's not, oh, there we go. Excuse me, just getting used to it. 
Uh, I'll give you a bit of a background. Uh, so uh, in uh, 2010, uh, Council uh, created a biodiversity offset program and uh, that involved an actual biodiversity offsets program officer as well as part of this uh, role. And uh, when that started, um, so if, if you don't know what, what offset programs do, it's, uh, it deals with um, unavoidable impacts on biodiversity through development. So in other words, when those things happen, uh, generally companies will then pay credits to offset any, any potential damage that they may do to the environment. So that kind of money then can be used on any high conservation value sites to protect and maintain those areas. Uh, and so that's, and so the idea was um, uh, created in 2010 and, and, and part of that program, uh, the, the officer decided, Joe decided to uh, buy some cameras and she bought 15 and uh, the brand is Fornatech. And uh, look, they at the time they were seen. They're quite they're well known for uh, cameras, creating cameras for, for this field. And um, yeah, it was um, it was it was kind of new to all of us. And um, so yeah, she went out and decided to um, use that um, the animal information as part of her program. It wasn't necessary for the program, but she thought it would be a good idea to have that that data. Um, and so look, they generally only went uh, during the spring season. Um, I, I think it's just because they thought that's just an active growth period and that's a good time for, to spot animals and see how it is in those reserves. And, and so they, uh, we currently only have four offset program sites at this stage, because it all depends on the quality of vegetation, the large trees to receive these credits. And, and these, uh, the reserves are Wards Reserve, Butterfields Reserve, Keith Hume Fraser, and Hillsville Transfer Station. Now they're great reserves, and um, over the years they've they've been fortunate enough to receive these credits, and therefore um, have weeds treated and plants restored, and 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 it's it's they're they're starting to look quite good these days. Um, but the funny thing is that they only did it in spring, and so the cameras were just sitting on shelves for the rest of the year. So uh, my team leader decided that, oh, well, gee, it's a good idea. Why don't we use these cameras for our team in, in the Bushlands team? And so it, it spawned from that. And it, that was in 2015. Uh, and it was, it was, we thought it might, we might as well like try and see what we've got, what animals we've got in all our other bushland reserves and, and some of our roadsides. So, and that's where it began really, the program. And uh, we're fortunate enough to um, be given good advice from Joe, the offset program officer and also uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, a, a zoology graduate uh, who volunteered at council during 2015 Megan and she uh, helped us tremendously in running the program starting it off and and um, running with it in that year so we now monitor 97 reserves and 105 roadsides and that's in a five-year program so every five years we'll go back to the site at the start. Um, so we've now actually got a set of data now of five years uh, from 2015 to 2019. Uh, in 2017, we needed to uh, apply for an animal ethics approval permit. Um, apparently the, um, the committee, which uh, comes from Agriculture Victoria, which is a state government agency, uh, they regularly meet and provide guidance on uh, animal treatment in terms of you know, trapping and, and monitoring. Uh, they mainly deal with this, this, when there's handling with animals and with fauna cameras, there is no handling, but uh, I think it, it came to their attention that when uh, bait is used for fauna cameras, uh, that uh, when, when they found what the ingredients was and what was occurring out on site, I think they made these decisions to tighten uh, the, the process and, and create a standard. So we undertook that process and we have to thank um, the New and Bigshire Council for assisting us on, the, on our permit process. Uh, it was, it was, there was a lot of detail that we have to put in there, but it's, 
I think it's quite important. Um, you know, they they meet only once a month and we provide them with the data and they gave us guidance and we resubmitted and changed the information just to suit the standard. And uh, it is a better way, like, because I worried that um, with bait and we use bait, um, we have to use bait. We've tried using cameras without bait. We've experimented and you don't get a lot of action without bait. I mean, if you're lucky enough to find a spot where there's lots of animal activity or, or even if it's something like a drought and you focus on the only remaining water way or area where there's uh, animal activity, a lot of animal activity, you may get some results without bait. Um, I have seen some people with, uh, showing success with that, but generally if you put it out in the middle of nowhere in the bush with no bait, um, and even if you're following a track or a trail or see scat, or evidence, um, well, you don't get that much uh, results. Like we sometimes had none um, once we've had them out there for two weeks. Uh, so yeah, bait is a good way of luring the animals to see what you've got in your site. So um, the, the issue with the bait was um, that they were concerned about bees because our bait, the standard use of bait is oats, uh, uh, peanut butter and we were using honey and they didn't like the idea of honey saying that it attracted bees and could cause issues with bees uh, so they changed it to the golden syrup um, but there's also other methods of uh, baiting as well like uh, using meat if you're predominantly looking for meat-eating carnivores to come uh, to the to the lure uh, so for us that would mean that there would be foxes and cats predominantly um, tuna oil for cats. Uh, apparently bandicoots like truffle oil that was recorded in 2014. Uh, and uh, there's been some studies recently. Um, a colleague of mine brought me uh, brought an attention to an ABC article about a PhD student that's uh, studying bait in Tasmania. And she, strangely, she found that feathers, like from feather boas, like those things that you can buy in op shops and that sort of thing, seem to attract almost all the animals like they're fascinated by it so i mean it's still in its uh, experimental phase um trying to find the best lure uh but yeah the important thing is to stick to the standards um as well because um there there is a risk that you know like say for example if foxes were privy to always going back to the bait where they know that other animals are sniffing out well then that could cause uh, predation of some of the native animals um yeah and look when it comes to getting this information too um we really uh, find that it's it's great baseline data like the more the animals that we find it, it allows us to uh, better manage our sites uh predominantly in the past we've always just been vegetation based um, we still are to a degree um thinking that you know if, you know trying to remove weeds and and revegetate sites will will provide habitat for the animals. Uh, but like in this way, this knowing that the animals are in there and what type of animals are in these sites, it will allow us to uh, better manage our weave strategies, um, you know, not to, you know, sort of remove everything at once or to um, target certain species if there's animals living in them. So, and, that, and that's pretty, and that's really important. Um, I have to say that, uh, look, look, a lot of this data that you get from fauna cameras, is not real, real full on science, I have to say, but it is really excellent observation skills to, to, to gain from it. Um, because yeah, this still, even knowing what animals are there is, is um, uh, makes a difference. And this is uh, how we set up our camera. So it's just a standard approach. Um, our cameras are old and they're still running. Like you can get uh, quite, uh, there's quite a few companies now that uh, sell cameras. Uh, apparently you can even get cameras from Aldi when they're on special there, when they, they bring them out. And uh, look, I've heard from some people that those cameras are quite good, uh, which, which there you go. Like, it, I mean, they'd be quite cheap there, but uh, look at the standard cost. And as you can see what, what we've got, we, we purchase the cable to protect it, the protective cover, um, you know, there's batteries involved, there's SD cards, uh, probably the whole package for is more, you could say roughly like 300 to $400 altogether per camera. So, but then look, it depends on what you want. Like we have the protective cover mainly because out on site in our bushland sites, 
I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. Like if a storm hit, branches fall, could easily land on the camera. I think it, it provides some good protection. Not only that, also from the animals. The animals, particularly wombats, like, tend to come really close to the camera and it's hard to see, you know, they start to blur the vision and it gets all bright and, but they like, I think they like to rub it up against the camera and maybe scratch themselves and, you know, like that sort of thing, you know, you don't want it, you don't want the camera to, camera to be uh, scuffed, I suppose, in, in any way. So that's, that's why we've got these covers and the cable, well, it speaks for itself. Um, you need to have those in case there's a bit of vandalism if people you know want to, will steal your camera. Um, they're pretty camouflaged out there, um, but look, even so, you can still if you spot them. You know, we've had kids spot them and they've tried to cut the cable and they've damaged ours uh, over the years. Some of them uh, we've learnt to um, camouflage it a bit more by putting some like fallen branches and twigs and leaves to cover them up and then. Another learning curve is that, you know, when you do that and then if the wind blows, it starts pushing branches over the front of the lens and it's, all, it's always a learning experience. You know, it's a bit unfortunate that they steal them, but um, um, yeah, like it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it hasn't happened a lot. We've probably had, oh, look, one, we had one bad occasion where six were taken in one hit and that was in the early days uh, in, the, in the biodiversity offset program time um uh, lately i had one a few weeks ago where kids after school just were playing in a, in a reserve and found it and tried to rip it off the tree and i think they just got paranoid and then eventually just got some screwdriver or something and stabbed it where, where you can see on this screen that where the gaps are where the where the lens is and where the the infrared light shines they stabbed it all thinking that maybe, you know, so they, they don't have any evidence <laughs> of their pictures on there. Um, we had one weird one once where in one of our reserves, the cable was snapped, the camera was uh, still there. And then when we took it out, the, ca the camera was missing the SD card, but everything was intact and they put it nicely back. Everything was back, tucked in, it was all fine. So everything was there, except we ended up losing an SD card and a broken cable and we kind of wonder they must have done something that they didn't really want any footage of so yeah you get those kind of weird things unfortunately with, with our bushland sites um oh, what else did i want to talk about with the cameras uh, oh look i think that's about it i mean when it comes to taking pictures so the cameras are designed to uh, trigger whenever there's movement uh, and uh, you can you can set create the settings on the camera to either have camera photos or or video imagery. Now I tend to go with um, camera mainly uh, only because it's easier to to go through all the, all the pictures because um, sometimes you could get so many photos, especially if it's a windy day or you know if there's branches moving slightly, it just it just triggers. So it will take a photo of, of that, and you could have like a, a, well over a thousand photos. And if it's on video, you pretty much have to watch all the video. Uh, even, if, even though it's 10 seconds long, it's just, it's, it's quite arduous. And um, fortunately, uh, I think Deakin University are, uh, uh, are doing some research on fauna cameras. And I think they've created some software where you can eliminate all those um, non-target photos immediately. So anything that doesn't have an animal on there, it will just be deleted. And also, I think they're trying to target life forms on there too. So it will pick up any life form that moves on the picture because that sometimes can be hard too, especially when it's dark. You might not be able to see much uh, movement and uh, um, you know, it's hard to see clearly in the dark. And, um, and if that's the case, I think they're still in developing um, further improvements to um, even uh, pinpoint exact species. And that, that would be fantastic. That will change everything. It, it saves so much time. This is the bait that we use. So yeah, we put this this particular bait uh, and style of bait. So we put the peanut butter inside this uh, PVC canister. Um, this idea came from, I think it was the New South Wales Parks, National Parks Service. Uh, they, uh, I think we saw this online and, and one of our staff members at council decided to make it for us. And it was pretty cheaply made. It was just piece PVC piping with some pretty strong mesh and getting like a tent peg. Um, 
And this, this is a great way. It's so easy to use. You just put it in there and just clamp it together and then bang it in the ground. And you place it about one and a half to two meters in front of the camera. Uh, and because any further, and then the problem is you, you won't be able to see the small rodents properly any, any closer. And then the animals will be too close to the camera. And then you're just going to get a lot of blur. Um, we had different methods, excuse me, before this, um, this style of uh, a bait capture. It's, um, we just used a tea strainer in the past, and that was before we created our, our uh, permit, our animal ethics approval permit. Uh, the problem with those tea strainers, even though it was easy to use and you could put the bait inside the tea strainer, we were just dangling them on, on a branch and foxes and other animals, brush tail possums would just take them away, which is not ideal. So then they were they'll, they'll assuming that they were gonna get a free feed. Uh, that's an example of a fox trying to eat it. You know, like uh, it's a, 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 the good thing is that these, uh, these canisters are quite sturdy. So the PVC pipe is quite strong and same with the mesh. But sometimes you still get teeth marks going through the mesh, but they haven't got, gotten into it yet. They're strong enough, but they're getting quite scuffed, some of them. Like it's not just foxes that uh, tend to chew on these, uh, on these things for us. It's also the uh, brush tail possum that seems to really have a good go <laughs> at the bait. Most of the other things seem to just sort of sniff it out, like wallabies um, and rats and that sort of thing. All right, I just wanted to show you uh, some of our results that we've had over our, our first five year period uh, from capturing uh, this information. Uh, as you can see on the left column, it, it shows the number of species that we've uh, captured on camera. Uh, fortunately, there's more native species uh, than introduced species, which is what we want to see. And that will be our goal uh, from now on. We always want to see more native species out there in our bushland sites, because that's uh, what we're trying to achieve really. We, we want the habitat to be there for them. And um, I suppose with like a lot of land, land clearing these days and, and uh, climate change, I suppose as well, like, you know, there's a lot of diminishing sites for them. There's not much refuge or places to be. And um, I, I really find that our council's bushland sites are a place for our native animals to be in, but they are also a place for our introduced species as well. So our pest animals, um, and, and there is quite a number still there, the 12, even though it's much lower. But um, as you can see in the next column where it says total captures, uh, you, you can see that the captures for introduced species is getting up there a bit, you know, like it's 59% to 41%. Um, it just shows um, how resilient our, our pest animals can be. Like they, they are starting to show their, you know, their might, I guess, but, but uh, yeah. Uh, the next column after that is total presence. Now, the difference between presence and captures uh, is, is that um, it's, more like, it's more like a presence absence thing per site. So if something uh, appeared, like say, for example, if that red fox appeared in one of our sites uh, five times, well, then that would, that's, that's five captures. But we would say that it only, you know, the presence it's once, it's only once in that reserve, that particular reserve. So it's per reserve, per site, that, that tally. And um, we do that because I think it's important to show that presence absence data. Uh, it, it will show how widespread species are and where they, where they tend to go to. And, and you'll see that in these graphs that I'll show right now. Um, this is first uh, total captures total captures of the top 20 species that we've captured in the last um, five years. Um, unfortunately, you can see that uh, the red fox, which is an introduced species, is at the top there, is number one. Um, it's slightly just ahead of the swamp wallaby. Them two are the most uh, prominent species that we capture on camera. Uh, I think it's just because of their versatility and their, their mobility. They, uh, you know, they tend to, they, they can move around quite easily. Uh, the red fox, that's really versatile. Like I have to say, like they are smart. These creatures are smart. Uh, they, they can go anywhere. There's been a, uh, some GPS tracking done on foxes a few years ago, and they measured that in one night, uh, one fox, traveled from somewhere near the inner city, somewhere like maybe near Sandringham Way along the coast, along the beach, uh, and went all the way to Frankston. 
uh, in one night. And like that's, you're looking at easily 20 Ks a night for a fox is not a problem. So they move around and, and the numbers uh, are predicted to be quite high uh, across the board with them too. And they, they don't have any boundaries. They can be, they predominantly like urban areas. So we've noticed that some of our reserves that are surrounded in by urban houses and, and you know, shops and that sort of thing, foxes like them. They're, they're there. They seem to, they tend to like to find scraps. They'll go after animals, but they also can eat scraps from rubbish bins and that sort of thing. Pet food uh, from people's gardens. But they can also be out in uh, in forested areas as well. And usually in those forested areas, which are quite high quality native vegetation, uh, some of the other pest animals don't seem to be out there other than things like uh, deer, which is becoming prominent now. Um, but foxes are widespread. Um, whereas wallaby, even though wallabies are, are quite good too, they don't tend to go much into the urban areas unless there is a large reserve nestled in there. They need space. You don't see them really in the urban surrounds. You don't see them all, you know, they wouldn't go near shops or anything like that. So that just sort of shows, you know, the tenacity of, of the fox, I guess. And, and hence why they, I'd say they're their number one pest animal uh in our know, ranges for sure um i just want to highlight um before i go to the next slide you can see the black rat there which is an introduced pest as well at nine percent the rabbit which is there at eight percent which is also introduced and the samba deer which is right at the end there at one percent i just wanted to compare that one with the next graph which is about total presence now as I explained before, there's a difference between captures and presence. But of, of course, when it comes to the fox and the wallaby, they're, they're such in high numbers that their presence and captures are always going to be high. Uh, I just wanted to highlight those three species because um, you can see in here that the presence of the black rat has dropped down to 6% here. So they're a bit lower down the scale and same with the rabbit at 5%. Uh, those two particular species, that, so that, see, that's the sort of data that we can sort of grab out of this. And, and that shows to us that even though there's high numbers of black rat and rabbit uh, in our sites, they don't tend to go, they don't, their presence is not widespread. So their presence is less than their captures to a degree. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is, um, for example, there are some sites that we have that are surrounded by farmland and rabbits love that. So they love the grass and then they love to hide in the bush. Uh, out of those sites, that's where they're dominantly living. Um, and that sort of shows that, you know, they're present only in selective reserves. Whereas, you know, you look at the wallaby and the fox, they're present, they're widespread. They'd be present in many of our reserves. And same with the black rat. Yes, they specifically would like things like with near waterways and drains. Um, so they're very selective in where they're going to be present. Um, when it comes to the Samba deer, I just wanted to highlight that that's gone up a pace a little bit. So like it, its captures were low, but out of those captures, they were, they, were, they were present in quite a few areas. So not in high numbers, but widespread. They're starting to, they're becoming a bit more widespread. Uh, unfortunately, and um, that seems to be across the board. All agencies are noting that, and there's a bit of pressure on deer now, and the state government um, really wants to target deer now. So uh, good on your wallaby. I just wanted to highlight here the wallaby. Um, they were the most present species. Um, it's, it's good to see the native animal reaching the top spot. Got to love the wallaby. It's a really good photo, this one. I uh, just wanted to highlight some key points. Um, from the information that we get from these uh, cameras. Uh, we found that uh, it is highly important for even for both native and introduced species that there is connectivity. So as I was mentioning before about land clearing and you know, like the, the, the sort of disturbance, I suppose, degraded areas, um, anything where there is some vegetation, uh, the, it, it, is, it is a highway. Like, uh, some of the tributaries that we had that go through some of our reserves, they just seem to travel right through them and head through to private residents, private properties, all through. So these, these corridors are, are highly imperative um, and the importance of them just really shows. Um, and um, 
Yeah, and an intact structure of native vegetation, it really d benefits native fauna. So what I mean by that is the structure. Um, if there's no structure, like if it is degraded, then you're going to get a less amount of native fa fauna. You're not going to get as much. They, they, they need that structure. They need the trees, the canopy, if it's, if it's like not out in the west where there's grasslands, um, but out here in our forested areas in our know, ranges, that tree canopy cover, mid-storey, you know, understory, lower story, ground cover. They need they they need the whole suite of those. If we've got that happening in our sites, then it benefits them greatly. Uh, and also, large bushland reserves tend to have a higher number of species as well. But that kind of makes sense. Like the larger, it's a larger refuge. There's an area, a space for them to to live in, to to feed, to hide. Um, so that's for both species. That one. When it comes to urban surroundings, definitely more introduced species are there. The smaller reserves, you start to get the you start to get the house mouse coming from you know that, that's just dominant in you know residential areas. Um, black rat as well, um, even the fox. They just yeah, and and the common blackbird. But even though the common blackbird, you, you sometimes tend to see that in the forested areas as well. And um, look, and a lot of this information, it, it provides us great data on pest animal management opportunities, um, which we really need to work on um, and, and hope that we can do something about in the future. But I mean, that sort of data, um, yeah, it really represents that, diff you know, the, the variation between native, veg uh, native animals and introduced animals and to, to work out ways to um, improve our site so it would benefit our native fauna. And uh, limitations to camera use, uh, there are some. Um, of course, I already mentioned that it, it's see that when you use the bait, the standard bait, um, which we do, we tend to use the standard bait because we want to capture as much animals as possible on our cameras while we put them out there. We tend to put them out there for two weeks at a length, at a time. That's the standard approach international benchmark apparently um, there is a book that we also uh, learnt and we purchased it was a, a book written in 2014 it's called camera trapping uh, it, wildlife management and research it's written by paul meek and others uh, it's a really good book it's a really excellent guide on to into how to how to actually use the cameras and and what you're going to get out of them and uh, it talks about those benchmark settings as well internationally and um, look, when it comes to um, putting this bait out as well, um, we yeah we tend to go with that uh, standard oat mix uh, because that seems to favour a lot of our mammals and our ground dwelling birds. They they seem to be attracted to that bait, but that that's what that bait attracts. It doesn't attract reptiles, doesn't attract amphibians. You know, we're not going to get snakes. We're not going to get uh, lizards. Uh, and, and some of the birds that are higher up, perched higher up in the trees, uh, yeah, they're not going to come down, you know, very rarely. So when, when you do get that, it's a, it's a significant find. Uh, there's variability with the numbers captured. And as I mentioned before, it's not a real true science, but a great observational tool, um, only because um, you cannot prove if it's the same species that's reappearing on, on the camera or a different species. So the, part of the standard benchmark is to um, uh, allow for 30 minutes per species. So once that 30 minutes is up on your time scale that you can see on your camera when you set up time on your camera in the settings, uh, then and it's a new species after 30 minutes. So technically it could be the same species and, and look, most likely it, it probably is, um, especially in the smaller reserves, we tend to get like a lot of captures of say brush tail possums throughout the two weeks. And I believe it probably is. And, um, but you can't prove or disprove. So that's a bit of a dis disadvantage. And the variability, like you don't know what's gonna happen at, our, at each site per year. You're gonna have the standard animals that may come that you're aware of, that you see evidence of when you're out in the field, but weather you know if it's raining and you know, some of the animals food and water like if it's drought uh you're not gonna you're gonna have different results um and, and depending on the time of year as well uh the other thing i wanted to uh just quickly mention is um 
Oh, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, the reason why it's out for two weeks. Um, well, we that's a standard because if you use bait, generally the bait will degrade in around that period. So then the bait's not even being used. So that's that's the general consensus. And also it allows other animals that are a distance away that can still smell that lure to come. So any anything in the surrounding area will will hopefully come and then you'll know what's in that area. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, yeah, the other threat that we have is that, yeah, the cameras can get stolen and damaged and that becomes a bit of an investment issue. Uh, and blurry photos, like, you know, I mean, the cameras are becoming better with, uh, with technology and, and I'm sure, you know, like our phones are, are becoming, you know, fantastic cameras. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the fauna cameras will, will do the same. But I mean, you get some good photos, and, uh, but sometimes you get blurry ones. Like the animal might just fly through the camera you won't even know what it is. And if you don't know what it is, well, you're going to have to write it as an unidentified uh, capture, I'm afraid. And unfortunately for us in council, we do have um, some experts that we can rely on if we do struggle to ID anything, like the staff in the biodiversity team and, and um, in the bushlands team have got the expertise to know what the animals are. Or we can even rely on the Arthur Ryler Institute, which is part of... Uh, uh, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Uh, they've got their scientists there that uh, specialise in some fauna. I just want to quickly uh, write that what one of the benefits as well of what when we use our cameras. So we have you ha had um, the opportunity to have the Green Army back in 2015 and 16, uh, which was a, gov a federal government initiative at the time. Um, as part of their experience and their training, uh, we showed them how to use the cameras and um, they were pretty excited about it out in the field and putting them out and especially when we saw the results. Uh, we've, so we did that at the Aqueduct Reserve, but we also included the Friends of as well. So they were part of the process and it was a, it was a fun day. Uh, we've also done it with uh, Glenfern Valley Bushland uh, Friends of as well um, out at their reserve and um, it, was, it had some good results too with, um, with the captures. Uh, it's a lot of this data and, and a, lot, a lot of these captures we put on social media. So the council webpage, uh, not, not regularly, but whenever I finish a, a yearly program, I'll send it to our communications team and, and then they'll put these, uh, the, the better photos that we have uh, online just to show everyone in the community uh, what critters we have around the area. Uh, and we also had the, um, the recent uh, working for Victoria uh, people uh, in our in council uh, during that COVID period um, come and assist with the cameras as well. And sometimes students, so we have students from university that need to build on their hours for experience or even work experience at high school, they'll come and join us. And we've had some success with some of them too. Um, we had one volunteer from university, her name's Jordan, and she, uh, she managed to like uh, gain some experience with us for a short time. And then she got a gig with the Green Army and and then I think she ended up being a team leader of the Green Army and, and then she worked at Phillip Island. And so, yeah, she's uh, got a zoology background. I think she now works for DELP. So, yeah, that's, that's a positive. Um, I'll just like now show you all the nice photos if I can. I hope I'm not going too far over time. Probably am. Um, this is just an example of what you can capture at, uh, at a reserve um, from, from when we put cameras out. This is Butterfields Reserve. Now, this is not from fauna cameras, this particular picture of the powerful owl. I just really like this picture. One of our staff from the biodiversity team spotted this photo and it's got a, you can see it's got a ringtail possum in its talons there. Um, yeah, this, look, that's an oak tree. We've got a few oak trees in Butterfields. Otherwise it's like high quality native veg. There's some, a couple of sections of heritage value in the reserve. So these are the kinds of pictures that we would be getting. So there's a, an antichinus there on the log, which is a, um, Kind of like a native mouse, I suppose. There's two different kinds that we have in our area, the dusky antichinus and the agile. Not easy to distinguish on the camera all the time. Um, I know there's duskies out at Butterfields, but I think there's agile as well. Agiles are smaller. They're much smaller than the duskies. Duskies are probably a similar size to, oh, probably like a mouse or a small rat, I suppose. Anti uh, the agile can be a bit smaller than that. Uh, there's a nice footage of just a wallaby there, like an older one there with its grey muzzle, just uh, browsing away. Uh, there's a nice wombat that we have there. And the good thing about wombats that when we capture them is that if we see that they've got mange, and mange is that uh, parasitic mite 
that sometimes goes into their skin and causes crusty lesions and and um, and hair loss and you know it's a quite a quite a nasty thing for them unfortunately the poor things um, yeah if we see any of that then we could uh, then try and locate where the, its burrow is and and um, and give it some treatment. The fox the fox is quite photogenic I have to say um, it's uh, it knows how to pose well in front of a camera um you get some yeah we've got an awful amount of good photos of the fox i suppose it's because it's, it's you know it's red color it's got a nice color i just want to quickly highlight uh just um just some of the things that we can get out of the data but just mind you this is anecdotal at best as i said before that um, some of the data that you get can really vary from for, for many reasons um when you when you go out to the same site again uh, so like, as you can see for wards reserve and butterfields, you can see that the captures that we had for deer have increased dramatically to 2018, um, which kind of shows a pretty decent trend there that you know deer is on the rise. And um, a lot of people that go out and work in the field will say that that is the case, but be mindful that deer are actually quite um, skittish to the camera. Lately, I have noticed that they have been on they, they are captured more often. In the early days of our program, hardly, they hardly came through. We had some sites where there, you could see scat and, and paw prints everywhere. And we had the camera there and they weren't even, they never went in front of the camera. They never went there at all. They were like very skittish to the smell of human scent or something like that, I suppose, or who knows, it could be like just noise, maybe dogs barking in the distance. But um, yeah, they, they seem to be on the rise. But look, I, I did go back to these reserves recently and the data is not as high. So like it's, it can be a little bit anecdotal, um, but still, like I said, it's good observation. It's, it's good data to still have, I think. I just really want to highlight this. This was um, captured in Sylvan. It is the goshawk, goshawk, the brown goshawk versus the rabbit. Now you don't often get the goshawk in the camera. Um, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit lucky to get them to come down. They sometimes do smell the scent, but it's not often. But in this case, they actually captured a rabbit. Like, I don't know if you can see the rabbit in its talons there, the fur, it scored <laughs> big time. And as you can see in the next few photos, it's getting ready to put it in its place. And then it's ready to take it away. See you later. <laughs> uh, and then we've had, we, we sometimes have some significant finds, um, some rare species pop up um, on occasions, which is really, this is the best that I, the best thing for, for why I do this, this is what I want to see. Like these are the surprises that we want. So even like you can see there's a lace monitor there and, and they're listed as threatened. Uh, lace monitor doesn't come to our camera because of the bait. They don't, they don't, they don't, it's just pot luck that it just happened to walk right through. Uh, and you can see here a long nosed bandicoot in, in the Mount Evelyn region. Um, they're not threatened, but uh, look, I, I consider them as locally rare. Um, they're, they're quite significant. To, you, know, you don't have them around that often, really. Uh, and um, look, in this instance, it's it's difficult to ID whether it's a long nosed bandicoot or not. So in, the, in this in this case, we sent this uh, these photos to the Arthur Riley Institute to uh, a person there that's um, an expert in bandicoots, and straight away, just some features that they saw and it said, "No, it's long nose. Uh, it, it wasn't the eastern barred. It didn't have the." The little the colouring on, on its body to, to call it that one, or, or the sun and brown and had different ear shape, all these different features that they were aware of. There's just another one of the same. Um, yeah, real significant find. This is a great, great find. We also have one here in the uh, Sassafras Creek area. Um, unfortunately, the photos aren't great, uh, but you know, it's a significant find, so I, I want to show <laughs> I want to show them because it's it's really cool. We also had uh, the bandicoot uh, spotted at the aqueduct reserve as well. Possibly the same one at Mount Evelyn. It could, they could be following a, a corridor there towards the silver catchment area. Uh, the lie bird, uh, look, that's, I find this significant. I mean, there, there are a lot of lie birds around in the, in the wet forested areas of, of Victoria, but they're such a cool bird, um, just the way they mimic, mimic with their sounds. This is also at the Sassafras Creek corridor area. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're lucky if you if you find where they have a mound and and like the, it's happening around now winter and now where the male is demonstrating its song and dance to to lure the ladies. Uh, yeah, it's 
it would, if you put it on video mode, the camera, you could really get some, some good footage. I just like this photo. It's the same area. Um, it's just got you know, just the color of the tails there that it's showing. Now it's a bad photo, but it's the only one we've got. Um, it's a koala that's found in the Warburton region. Um, we've captured only a couple on camera. Again, this, this critter doesn't follow the bait, even though it's gone to the bait. I mean, obviously it, it likes eucalyptus leaves. It was just a bit of potluck that it just came through and traveled through in the camera here. Good find. Um, we don't have many in Yarra Ranges. Uh, I, I suppose it's, you know, it's the type, the type of eucalyptus trees that they, that they prefer. Um, it's probably not um, dominant in the Yarra Ranges area. Oops, sorry, I went too far. Uh, just this is a, um, uh, a sugar glider. Um, I just wanted to highlight this because, um, again, this is something that stays mostly up in the treetops rather than comes down. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good find. You can just sort of tell the difference. You can see the flappy parts to its arms where it would you know, sort, of, sort of form the wings. Another brown goshawk. And, and uh, this one's captured something which is already quite mangled. It's hard to tell what it is. You can see how we, the old bait too that we used to use, the tea strainer there. That's what we used to have. Um, not, not recommended it, uh, today. Um, this one's a very blur, a bit blurry, this photo, but it's um, an owl at night jar. Uh, it was found in the Mount Evelyn area as well. Um, it, this one was hard to ID. I knew it was a nocturnal bird, like an owl of some kind, even though it's a night jar, which is not an owl. Um, yeah, I needed uh, expert opinion on this one and uh, found it thanks to uh, Amanda from our biodiversity team. He's very good with birds. This one's great. This one's a brush-tailed fascigale, which is found in the Hillsville area. We don't have many of these. This is a threatened species, and uh, it was a great find. You can see it's brush-tail, why it's called brush-tail, with that brush on its, on its tail there. It's fantastic. It's kind of like um, our version of a squirrel. Uh, it's, yeah, there's more of them in, Nilum, in the Nilumbik area. They like it uh, drier than, than here, but, yeah, very significant. Jumping into the families, oh look, yeah, these are just happy snaps of, you know, families, the common brush-tailed possum. Oh, you can see there a joey there. Oh. And that's another old um, form of bait that we had uh, where we put it in this little cage and put on a star picket. So we changed our game a little bit there, but it became a bit arduous because of carrying all this heavy material to put the bait in. It was kind of hard work. Uh, it's, it worked to a degree, but once we got those um, PVC pipe canisters, they're, they're, they're a lot easier. As you can see in there, there's a joey sticking its uh, head out of the pouch. So you see what I mean when they sometimes come really close to the camera, it gets a bit, uh, bit blurry. A deer, a uh, fellow deer, these ones, because the, these are the ones with the spots. Uh, some people refer to as Bambi. Uh, some wallabies uh, you know, snuggling up there. There's some fox cubs having a bit of a play with the bait there, probably having a little bit of training while the mother rests somewhere near the den. So this kind of footage here would, uh, you know, would show to us if, you know, if we could run a pest animal management program to perhaps look into where the den is here and, and see if uh, anything could be done. This is a nice uh, photo of uh, the wombats here. And you can see that it's on a different angle. So you can experiment. Now the standard approach would be to only go like from about 30 meters up from the ground onto the tree to put the camera. Uh, and in that way, it's, it, you get, you, it's got a wide scale on the camera and you can really capture a lot. And, and the idea is to get it onto the bait so you can see the small rodents as well, but you can move the camera up higher if you're specifically targeting uh, larger mammals like kangaroo or um, deer. So deer hunters would put the cameras up high if they were like trying to find where to track the deer and where they're moving through. Um, but in this case, it's on an angle on the branch. So if you're lucky enough to find a branch that's sort of leaning over and you can face it down, it's great for things like finding uh, uh, to look at rodents. So if you, it's hard to ID rodents sometimes on the camera, you need to get access to see the tail. A long tail is the black rat. Uh, a shorter tail, like only the body length is a bush rat and some of the shorter, some, some rats tails are even shorter. 
um, like the swamp rats and then mostly to the body length, almost up to the body length. So you can definitely tell a black rat with its long tail and its long snout. Uh, but it's hard to ID rats sometimes. It's just, it's, yeah, just the way they move so fast. This is a good photo. You get into a bit of brawling as well. Wallaby's having a bit of a play. Also, you can see there some Eastern Grey kangaroos. And mind you, that's just uh, the it was the bait was just put on some kind of some kind of thing to there. I didn't put the camera up here. It was a colleague of ours. I think it's because it was too grassy. They didn't have a tree or a branch to put the bait on. Um, as you see, the, there's a great escape here. You can see the fox there. Good photo of the fox, but you can see there the bird just flying away just in time. Let's say. Grey fantail. Also this one. So this one, is, there's footage of a rabbit here, sort of scurrying. It's, I don't think this is in sequence, but I'm going to make it look like it is. And then there's the brown goshawk. It's come down, missed it. it. Looks pretty angry and stealthy, this bird. But that was the, ex the exact same location where that rabbit was um, scratching. Dodgy characters, that's me. Um, back in the day, uh, putting cameras out. Yeah, we do sometimes get some weird characters out when the cameras uh, are placed. Uh, we once had, I don't know why, but um, in a, a remote area down in a gully that has no trails um, near a tributary, a person with pyjamas started walking around with a plastic bag and some slippers. And we're like, I just thought, what? I think they were, uh, I think they were um, looking for mushrooms personally. Uh, here's the echidna. They're attracted to the bait because lots of ants like bait. Echidna again. See, there's the eastern grey kangaroo. As you can see, the camera's a bit higher here. There's a joey. I think that's the, the eastern grey kangaroo that won the battle. It looks like it, it, it looks pretty grand, looks pretty happy. Uh, there's a ringtail possum. Another ringtail possum enjoying the bait there. Uh, this is a rare find uh, only because they don't come to the bait. And uh, you can see that that's a southern water skink. Just a bit of luck there. Wallaby with, you know, in the sun. Love their, uh, you know, the shades of colours that they show. Munching away. That's a black rat. See how long its tail is? And then it's got its long snout. You can smell the bait there. Someone's cat. Uh, it almost looks like it's going, what are you looking at? Yes, we often get cats. And, you know, some people don't contain them, unfortunately. This one's a domestic. Doesn't look feral. Brush tail possum. One grooming. Happy wombat. Oh, there's a wombat's eye. And you can see a rabbit in the distance there. Oh, this is a, a loose merima. Um, I think it's neighboring the property. It must have got out and it's really, it's on the track to, uh, for something. And this fox, see the fox hiding in there? That's in the same reserve. So hopefully it was going after that. But <laughs> so you know what I mean? Foxes just take great photos. Such a great photo of the fox. And I just wanted to show some of the birds, the, some of the ground dwelling birds that we have, the Australian magpie. There's a satin bower bird eating some fruit. There's its eye close up, nice blue eye. Uh, that's the yellow faced honey eater there. And the, the superb fairy wren, the male, beautiful blue color. And that's the uh, white browed scrub wren. That's a very common ground dwelling bird that we often get on the camera. Uh, that's pretty much it for my presentation. I just hope, yeah, if uh, you got something out of that, I hope I didn't ramble on too much. And um, yeah, if you don't have a camera, I'd suggest you, you look into it and it's worth giving it a go. You get some, some good insights and you can see what you get in your backyard. So, thank you very much. Oh, I, well, thank you, Paul. Well done. Um, I think we can all agree that that was um, a fantastic um, presentation. Um, and I've done a bit of camera monitoring myself, but I still took a lot out of that. So thank you.
Um, and I do have some cats here at home, but I promise that they're indoor, everybody. They don't go roaming in the reserves. Um, we'll have a look at our questions now. And um, we have a few here, Paul. So the first one was, um, do you cover just council reserves or other areas as well? Uh, just council reserves and um, and just our council roadsides. Um, just to be mindful that they're not all our council reserves that are programmed for fauna monitoring, um, only because some sites are just too difficult to put them in. They're too small, they're too exposed, they'd be damaged, they'd be spotted. And some of the roadsides, uh, they're too narrow. Um, we've learnt over the years to not accidentally face the camera towards traffic, because then that's all you get. You get lots of lights and lots of cars coming past. <laughs> Um, it was an accident, really, but uh, yeah, like yeah, just it's it has to be well secluded. And uh, but you know we've we've lent out cameras before to community group members, but yeah, it's it's only on council land. Yeah, no problem. Um, our next question that came through was, do we need permits to bait on private land? Oh, that would I'm not sure about that actually. Um, it's probably a question or, or something to look up. On the internet to see or would check out the um, animal ethics committee and see what they say about that um yeah it's um they'd probably say yes i'm not sure but look yeah if, if community members did go through that permit process it's it's for free agencies have to pay a fee um and yeah so it it's well it's up to you um you can go without bait if you want to um, if you really have like a good, like you can just put a bowl of water if it's dry in summer and you're going to, you, you potentially get quite a few animals going to it um, and that should be fine. But um, yeah, I'd look into it first. I think I'm, I'm not 100% sure when it comes to private residence. Yeah, one of our attendees actually wrote a bowl of water works well in the summertime. So yeah. very true. Um, the next question we had was what direction do you face them I've had too much light on the lens and you can't see the birds sometimes well yeah uh, that's an interesting point um, yeah I suppose if you like sort of it depends on where the northerly aspect is I don't really focus on that a lot my main focus is safety first so it's more about the best location away from any any crowds or uh, or even neighbours that have got dark barking dogs. Um, we've had it in the past, no no animals rock up. And, and I assumed when I got there that I heard the dog barking, I thought, oh, that's what it was. Uh, just somewhere secluded. I think it's, you know, if you find a secluded spot, there should be enough shade if it's a bushland site. If it's open in the area, well, then I think maybe it's, it might be best to face it away from the northerly aspects so the sun doesn't glare onto the camera. Um, yeah, but when it's secluded, secluded too, only because um, we've had issues with wind. <laughs> if, we, if we put it in the open area and then all of a sudden the, the wind forecast comes through, um, gee, the amount of photos that we get for nothing <laughs> and we have to scroll through, is um, it's pretty tedious. So, um, yeah, I, I think that would be the, the, the best option just to know which, which, which direction the sun's going, where, what aspect it's on. Yeah, I agree. Um, we also had a question about um, was is bush rat a type of rat? And I answered part of this question and said, yes, you were referring to a particular rat. Yes. Um, but you had a um, the other parts of this question was, have we ever had swamp rats um, yes. in our reserves? Yep, we have. Yep. Um, on occasions, uh, and we can spot them out because uh, they've got a different, slightly darker colour. Um, to the bush rats, uh, but they also come out during the day sometimes, swamp rats. And uh, so fortunately, yeah, that's where we've spotted them on occasions, it's, it's, it's daytime. And yeah, and you can see that they've got a bit of a, almost like the, the wallaby, um, like kind of, kind of like a reddish tinge to mm. their fur. So um, yeah, uh, not as many, not as many. We, we tend to get quite a lot of bush rats um, and black rats as well um uh but we I, i'm not sure if we've ever i don't know we haven't spot, spotted the rare broad toothed rat yet um but yeah i've heard of some pe some people that have spotted them out in the field so fingers crossed we get we get we get them because they're they're listed as rare mm. um, yeah 
We'll just go through a couple more and then um, we will probably have to leave it there, everybody. Um, but we'll do our best to follow up any questions that go unanswered. Um, we were talking before about, well, you were talking before about um, if you had a brush top possum in front of the camera for 30 minutes and mm -hmm. then at the 40 minute mark, um, you still saw, uh, you saw a brush top possum. Um, I believe you meant you could consider it a different individual. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Yep. So that would be then a, like if, if we considered that first one as one capture then after that 30 minutes, yeah, and if it came back again, like if it was the 31st minute even, uh, we'd consider that as a second capture. It's just, it, it has, there has to be, you have to draw the line somewhere, I suppose. There has to be some kind of rule in play um, or, um, yeah, because, I mean, it could potentially, you can't deny if it is or isn't, um, it could be a different possum potentially. Yeah, completely. Um, there's a really, really good question here um, that I might get back to um, the person that wrote this one uh, about council um, extending surveys into private property. I think I can um, do just justice to that um, by following that question up. Um, it's probably just a bit too much to talk about right this moment. But we, the next one we had was, um, do we have any footage from Belgrave or Selby? Uh, yes, yeah, we do, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if, oh, I think most of the ones that I put on, on, on this presentation are just purely because of, um, they were just good quality photos, some of them. Uh, but yeah, we, we have captured quite a bit in the Belgrave and Selby area as well. Um, yeah, we put them out in Belgrave Lake, Birdsland Reserve. Uh, and, um, also in Selby, we um, uh, Minac Reserve. Yeah, we've yeah we we cover all those site most of those sites in those areas uh, and had good results too. Like there's lots of wallaby and out in that region. Okay, excellent. Um, I'll do my best to follow that one up with perhaps a bit of a list of what we've seen or something like that. Paul and I can discuss that at a later date and see what information we can provide. Um, I'm going to say last question. Um, this one is, is there somewhere we can send our photos and videos of wildlife to help with identification? I suppose council is an option. Um, look, I think our, our teams uh, are, are quite capable to to give it a go. And if they can't, well then I suppose then we could refer it to uh, some of the scientists that we know that are working at Arthur Ryla or, um, or elsewhere, possibly even at universities that, um, yeah, that are experts usually are on specific animals. So they have a good grasp on what it is when they see footage of it for sure. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, um, we're gonna leave it there everyone. I think we can all agree it was very interesting. Thank you so much, Paul, um, for coming along.